Hi, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> well, David was saying that you guys are really quiet, so I'm like, hi, everyone. That's still really weak. Hi, everyone. It's at exactly the same, consistent quiet. Uh, no jokes, okay, anyway, sorry. So let's get down to business. Today we're, to talk, uh, we're, we're here to talk, uh, talk to uh, the CEO of Razor. Um, I'm gonna dig in a little bit about um, how Razor started, how you see the industry growth and whatnot, uh, but you know, just by starting, you know, how are you, Min? I'm good, how's everyone? Let me try. <laughs> <laughs> Hello everyone, how many gamers do we have in the room? Gamers, anyone? All right, everybody who didn't raise their hand, get out of the room. You're, you're not very cool, <laughs> all right? Okay, I'm good. Um, it's always good to be back in uh, Singapore. And, uh, you know, we founded the company simultaneously both in California and Singapore. I don't spend so much time over here now, but um, it's always good to be back. Yeah, great. I mean, if, for, the, for the audience's context, uh, you know, Razor was founded, I, I believe, in 2005, four? 2005. I mean, and I think we always talk about in, in, in the Tech in Asia conference about, you know, the Series A drought, the Series B drought, and the, the, the C drought, and winter is coming. Tell me about your winter, Min. About how sure. it was, uh, how, how easy was it for you to raise funds in 2005 in Singapore? In Singapore, 2005, um, <laughs> you know, I, I think uh, startups, uh, in fact, the, the concept of a startup I think didn't really exist uh, as a word. I'm sure, it, you know, it was more like, are you an entrepreneur? Uh, you want to start your own business? Um, there was, there weren't any um, like a traditional Series A. I mean, there were there were VCs around, but it, it's completely um, different from what you see today. Uh, so raising capital, I think, back in the early days was um, really difficult. I think specifically for Razor. First up, we were in the gaming industry, which back then wasn't really considered an industry, right? It's a niche market. Every, everyone I met was, oh, you're in a niche market. Is it going to be interesting? Years later, you know, today gaming's a big industry. Everyone's excited about it. So, so that was one. Um, secondly, I think we, we were looking at hardware. Mm -hmm. And yeah. um, back in the day, hardware was a complete no-no, mm -hmm. I think, for um, all the investors out there. So we had a couple of um, very crazy seed investors. And to this date, uh, to date, I still say you guys were probably crazy in investing money in us. But uh, yeah, it, it turned out well for us. But it was, it was really difficult. Um, we couldn't even count the number of people who would be interested, etc. cetera. But uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was a tough time. And when you kind of also try to find opportunities for funding in, in the US or different markets, how was the overall reception different? Uh, how did you feel about talking to those investors? How was the overall viewpoint of when you took your value proposition to them? How was the difference in feedback? I think it was tough too. You know, <laughs> given the hardware globally at that point of time, I think uh -huh. Um, the hardware renaissance pretty much came about only in the past uh, couple of uh, the recent years. I mean, if you think about it, it was only after the move um, how Apple had really grown to be a, a, a really large company with uh, people like Google, Facebook, etc. It's exploring hardware, mm -hmm. uh, the democratization of hardware through Syngin, etc. It's only happened in recent years. But back in the early days, um, it was difficult too. And um, our proposition back then was connected devices, right? We said, we're going to build a, a huge hardware platform. They're all going to connect, connect back to the cloud. And unfortunately, we were again ahead of our time because today it's called IoT, right? Um, we didn't have buzzwords like IoT. And, and to be candid, I think um, there's an ongoing joke that startups today can raise money by cobbling together all kinds of buzzwords, right? Today, I've got an AI thing running, uh, a SaaS platform or whatever. You put to get enough of it together in a PowerPoint deck, you're going to be able to raise seed money, etc. I've but fallen for it. It's OK. It's <laughs> <laughs> but it's, uh, it's, it was tough. I think globally, whether it was in, at Sand Hill um, or, or whether it was in Singapore, etc. cetera. Um, so in the, for, for the starters, I think we started with um, really committed seed investors, angel investors, and um, we hit um, pretty good traction before we started getting institutional investors in. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I think a lot of people would be interested in kind of understanding how you cultivated such a marquee relationship with guys like Intel. Like, how does that happen? Um, how does Min make it work with such a, I mean, you have Razor and then you have Intel, right? Mm -hmm. How does that relationship become struck? How does it become cultivated? I think uh, those kind of insights would be very helpful for the, the, for the crowd. Sure. So companies like Intel, I think, they do a, a phenomenal business. And, and I think they're really great at what they do. But I think over and above, what they've done, I think, for the entire industry is 
they're one of the bellwethers, of course. And um, they truly understand, I think, the role of startups that play within the entire ecosystem. They've got a, a really great corporate venture arm, uh, Intel Capital. And uh, pretty much, you know, the, the guys at uh, Intel Capital come in, they have, a, they have a finger on the pulse on the entire industry. I mean, bear in mind that virtually every company works with them one, in some shape or form. And um, they just uh, invested in us, uh, they gave us the runway, they um, uh, you know, provided the introductions. I think they were probably one of the, our best uh, institutional investors out there. And they really brought um, a whole host of uh, connections across. Now, for ourselves, we had to navigate you know, within the Intel capital, uh, in, 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 within the Intel um, framework. And I think Intel Capital played a really great role in terms of facilitating a lot of these introductions within the different uh, groups. And, and don't get me wrong, you know, sometimes you had to, to market within Intel to um, evangelize the, the work that we're doing. But at some point, you know, you, when you hit the right um, champion within Intel, the, the right uh, uh, business unit, uh, uh, the right GM to speak with, you, you essentially get a lot of runway to uh, build stuff together with them. And they're really open about it. Sure, sure. And I mean, digging into today's headline or yesterday's headline, um, you had some big news yesterday. Can you tell us a little bit about that? I mean, I think also in many ways, this is part of a vision that you're trying to create in terms of how you create sustainable partnerships, but also sustainable businesses. Uh, give us kind of your bullet points on how it, how it happened and uh, you know, what your forward steps are from now on. Sure. So um, yesterday, you know, very exciting news for, for ourselves. Um, we announced a global strategic partnership with um, one of the biggest telcos in the world, the Three Group, uh, owned by Hutchison. So Three uh, essentially has um, telcos in throughout Europe, uh, the UK, Austria, Denmark, Ireland, etc. And um, they're also one of the biggest telcos, if not the biggest, in uh, Hong Kong. So with that global footprint, I think one of the things that uh, came about is that they wanted to explore the youth market. And uh, we sat down, we hammered together a deal very, very quickly. I think we got all the right decision makers. We locked ourselves in a room in London. And we um, essentially have come out with a global strategic deal that um, encompasses three things. First of which, co-branding and co-marketing. We're going to be working very closely with them um, to reach out to the youth, uh, the gaming market, the, the youth market, etc. cetera. Uh, esports in particular, we're one of the biggest brands in esports in the world. Um, Secondly, in terms of mobile devices and tariff plans, so we, we bring our expertise with the gaming community, our know-how, the content, and we're going to be working very closely with them in terms of um, building out solutions for them. Now, bear in mind, 3 is, is, is a huge company, but what we are able to do very quickly and um, in a very nimble fashion is to, to work with them to um, customize plans, customize um, devices, customize products, for, user base, for a user base that, that is notoriously difficult to reach, the youth, right? The millennials, so to speak. Now, finally, I think the third thing is um, we've got Razer Z Gold, which is a virtual currency that we've built, um, which is a single fiat currency for all gamers worldwide that, that you're able to exchange it for, for um, uh, currency in different games, so on and so forth. It's something we just launched this year. So every three store, the thousands of stores in Europe, the thousands of stores out there, the you know, gamers worldwide can go out and um, purchase Zigold from there. So it's a, it's a very long-term partnership. We've got um, different uh, specific regional um, kind of initiatives happening with three. For example, in Hong Kong, we're going to be opening a, a Razer store together with three in a, in a pretty cool location. Um, with Ireland, we're going to be working on eSports together with them in an eSports arena. Um, so this is, this is important, like right? working with a large company, uh, we've got to keep really nimble. We've got to have dedicated account staff yeah. uh, just servicing um, what's happening with our partners. Sure. I, and, and, and kind of extending to that, uh, obviously you've, you've made some uh, really interesting and really kind of, uh, you know, like kind of uh, moniker acquisitions from Nextbit to THX and whatnot. And now you also talk about staying nimble, staying ahead of the curve and making sure that you can actually be flexible to see what's coming up next and see around the corners. Can you talk a little bit more, a little bit more about that agility plus your ideas around uh, inviting more families into the Razor ecosystem, such as the Nextbit family and the, the THX family? Sure. So um, I think what we've been effective at, at Razer is to build a hardware software platform, right? So 
Um, we started with just a mouse, but we, set, we expanded to be um, the world's number one in terms of gaming peripherals at this point of time. And from there, we've gone on to new categories like gaming systems, which requires an entirely different approach in terms of engineering and design. Um, in terms of doing that, it's not, you know, you can do it two ways, right? You can try to scale it up in, in terms of um, trying to get existing guys and say, okay, go figure it out and, and, and go build me a laptop, etc." Or we could go out and, and look for the best talent out there. So traditionally, how we've done is that we've gone out, um, for example, with um, our laptops. Uh, when, when I wanted a gaming laptop of my own, I went out, we acquired, we actually hired um, some of the best talent in the valley uh, that were really great at building you know, powerful devices in a thin, small form factor. And that company was OQO. So it was a complete acquihire. We brought them in, incubated them for about two or three years before we came out with our first product. Um, likewise, I think, I think since then, we've done a couple of acquihires. Um, Ouya, which is an Android micro console, which um, I think some of you may be familiar with, one of the biggest Kickstarter uh, successes in the world. Uh, they went on to raise money from Benchmark, etc. We acquihired the team. Uh, back a few years ago. And um, recently, we also acquired uh, Nextbit, which is um, uh, the makers, some of the uh, guys from ex-Google uh, who are part of the core Android team. Um, they had built a really, really cool um, cloud phone called the, um, the Nextbit Robin. So they were gamers also at the same time. So we brought them in. So these were acquihires that we've, we had done. But over and above, I think our ambitions have always been for gamers, by gamers, Gaming is today one of the, in fact, it's the biggest segment in entertainment. It's a $100 billion industry. But gamers, you know, bear in mind, we're not a gaming company. We don't make games. But we work every day for the gamer. And the gamer today plays his games on a mobile phone. He plays it on a PC. He, he plays it on Xbox and PlayStation, so on and so forth. And the mobile segment is incredibly important to us. So on, on that end, that's why Nextbit came about. But outside of gaming, there's also movies and music in the entertainment industry. So when the, when the opportunity came about for us to acquire Lucasfilm's THX, and I think you know, it's a company older than me, um, where you know, it's um, one of the big cult brands. I mean, all of us, you know, it's very cool. You watch Star Wars, boom, you know, get the THX sequence and stuff like that. It's super cool, super fun. It, it was like a no-brainer for us, right? Cult brand, in between the content, they don't make films either and the, and the uh, entertained, a little bit like what Razer is, it's really the next steps for us. We want to build a true entertainment company on a massive scale, um, global, and uh, really get the best talent within. It's all about the talent, it's all about the team, it's all about the people. In terms of, I mean, I, I think you talked to some very important points about mobile. Can you give us kind of a bird's eye view and also kind of a driver's seat view of how the gaming industry has changed over the past, you know, I guess 10, 10 11 years? Uh, obviously, there's more shift towards mobile. You have an interesting situation where people are happy to watch other people play, you know, like Warcraft or some kind of thing on TV, yet on their couches, they're playing, you know, Clash of Clans on their mobile phones, right? Mm -hmm. There's an interesting dichotomy going on here. You know, can you, can you give us the feedback or some insights on how you uh, understand that kind of interaction and where you see Razer going? Sure. So, you know, at Razer, we don't have focus groups. We don't, um, you know, look at general business reports. I'll, I'll, be, I'll be honest. We don't do any of that, right? We don't do market research or anything. We look at ourselves as gamers and we design products for ourselves. So the entire gaming industry has been growing um, gangbusters for the past couple of years. And it's not just the mobile industry, the mobile gaming um, segment. PC gaming has been growing you know, exponentially for the past couple of years. Um, the console gaming market has been doing incredibly well also over and above. Of course, mobile, because it's just grown a lot faster than the rest of the, the, the segments. But our real focus is actually the entire gamer population out there. There are two billion gamers out there in the world, right? And the gamers, in essence, it's hard to kind of pigeonhole them or segment them within, oh, you're a PC gamer. Because the PC gamer, for that matter, may be playing um, Overwatch. He may be playing League of Legends, uh, so on and so forth, um, on his PC. But on his way to school, on his way to work, he's playing Clash Royale, so on and so forth. He might be playing um, on the console when he goes to his buddy's house, so on and so forth. So I think on this end, the gaming industry has been growing both um, horizontally and vertically. Horizontally in the sense that there are a lot more geographies today that um, you'll see gamers, right? China, for example, boom, free-to-play 
just created an entire massive market in China for PC gaming. Huge. League of Legends is a Tencent game. It's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful game. It's getting a lot of players, but there's Dota also at the same time. There's all kinds of MOBAs, etc. Now, that's the PC side of things. Geographically, it's been growing, and then mobile has, has kind of come in over and above. But the demographic has also been growing um, vertically. You're seeing kids today, two-year-old kids going to a TV screen. I like to use this as an example because those of you who might have kids will, will see that. Little kids are now swiping the TV screen wondering, why doesn't this um, interact? It's, it, it doesn't make sense. Gamers are getting younger. But over and above, you're seeing a lot of gamers get older mm. you know, through casual games and through a lot more accessible games. So the entire market is growing. Ourselves at Razer, we are really focused on all aspects of gaming. We're one of the few companies that um, we're officially partnered with uh, Xbox and PlayStation on the console side. On the PC side, when the entire PC market was coming down and we just completely ignored you know, everyone who was telling us, oh, you know, this doesn't make sense, we said, look, I want a gaming laptop, so I'm just going to get into the gaming laptop business. Now the gaming laptop business or the gaming desktop business is the only growth area within the PC space. It's growing incredibly fast. So now we are excited about the mobile side of it. And I'm going to answer it before you even ask me. You know, I've got no comments about whether we've got a Razer Mobile coming up or anything like that. Or a toaster. I mean, everybody's talking about toaster. <laughs> well, no, there's not going to be a toaster either. Um, the, uh, I think the entire premise <laughs> yeah, just threw me a curveball over there. For those of you guys in the know, it's an ongoing joke in the Razer community, right? Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, the, the, the mobile space, definitely very exciting. And we do see a lot of things that can be disrupted that can be built for the mobile gamer is just um, over there waiting. And, and kind of um, dovetailing towards that, how important is community development on top of how you want your communities to see Razer? Uh, let me give you a, a real life example. For me, I have used <laughs> Razer mouse, mouses, mice, for Thank like you. five, like f uh, for the past three or four years, but it's not for gaming. Uh, I, for me, it's a, it's a, it's a disease from my job where I have to uh, make a lot of PowerPoints, okay? Mm -hmm. And for some reason, I, I, can't, I can't use any other, other mouse when I'm actually in the office, and I use Razer mouses because there's mice, damn it, because they're so accurate and they provide less latency, right? Sure. Now, I believe that's not the, your target demographic, mm -hmm. but how you create that kind of imagery of multiple utility and also a sense of ownership among the, 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 the user base? Um, so I think we are always focused um, at Razer for gamers, by gamers, um, essentially on the gaming community. And the gaming community essentially demands the fastest, the most precise, the very top best type of technologies out there. And they're evangelists at the same time. I hate to say it, but the gamers are probably the coolest uh, segment um, you know, in the tech space, right? Um, you know, notwithstanding anything. But in, in short, if you look at all the new technologies coming, up, coming about, um, getting out there, VR, where did it come from? Gaming. Motion sensing, where did it come from? Gaming. You know, all of that. Um, gesture recognition, where did it come from? Gaming. So on and so forth. It's, it's really the, the central focus of really getting new technology, technologies across because entertainment, having fun, is the easiest way. The iPhone, for example, you know, the first couple of games you can think of that really caught everyone's imaginations, Angry Birds. You know, things like that, you can't play Angry Birds on a on traditional kind of analog um, touch type thing. So. Um, what we've realized is that while we are 100% focused on gamers, because of the benchmark or the bar of um, the tech that we provide, it actually serves the wider audience incredibly well. So we've got a lot of finance professionals that use our keypads for, mm -hmm. for trading because we can execute, they can execute um, uh, signals faster. So the banks are actually a pretty big uh, customer of ours. Now, they ask us, can you make it less gamer focused and stuff like that? We go, well, we could, but it's still you know, that's our bread and butter. We're always focused on gamers. Happy to sell you guys that, but that's how it is. The military, um, we don't talk about this much, but there's a huge military kind of um, customer base for us because of uh, precision, um, because of executions. Even our gaming laptops are deployed in the field. Why? Because it's got an um, incredible amount of processing power and it's super thin and super light, which is great for the guys to use that. The um, DJs out there, lots of music DJs are using it. Um, PowerPoint. You know, always a favorite. Designers are using our, our mice and things like that. So I think for us, while it's a big market, and candidly, we could probably triple or quadruple our business overnight by just opening up. But you know, Razer isn't a business for me, right? At the end of the day, I'm just doing it because it's fun. 
Um, it's cool. You know, I want to focus on games. I like to play games. I want to get off this and play, you know, the latest game I'm playing, which is this very fun game called Play Unknown Battlegrounds, which is very fun. Play it. So um, that's the um, premise for us. And, and we will continue to focus on gaming. Now, all kinds of other companies now are getting excited about gaming. They think, great, I want to access this market. I'm going to make a shit ton of money from these guys. But these are the same companies that are going to move on and, and find the next cool thing after, after gaming, right? We started with gaming when gaming wasn't cool. Gaming is cool now. We're still focused. We're the number one lifestyle brand for gamers and continue to be. And when gaming isn't cool at some point of time in the day, I'll still be a gamer and we'll always be for gamers by gamers. Great stuff. And I'm I, I, kind of looking forward the next four or five years, 10 years. Um, I mean, again, you see uh, yourself as a gamer, but where do you see Razer kind of elevating itself towards? Do you see yourself becoming a more of a hardcore brand and kind of an, a Jobsian brand where you, you create that cult even bigger? Or do you find yourself looking at a bigger vision of how you want to cultivate your Razer ecosystem? Um, I think the community is incredibly important to us. And we talk directly with the uh, community all the time. Mm -hmm. So um, we are not a ivory tower of sorts that we hide inside and design our products um, in secret. We are always talking to the community. Um, and that is an integral, important part about Razor where you know, our, our Facebook, our social media is um, one of the biggest, I think, in the industry. And we're always chatting with uh, our users, myself. I actually run my own Twitter. I run my own Facebook page. I get to say, talk all kinds of shit to the customers at any point of time. I mean, I don't take shit from the customers either. Um, and, and it's just a, a phenomenal way for all startups. And I, and I really recommend all startups to do that, right? To always talk to the customer, to always engage with them, and uh, primarily because these are the most important people, I think, to the company and to the team. And um, I think for us, we just want to do what we're great at, which is making premium product. You know, we, we like to say that we don't design to price. There are many companies out there that will make stuff at a budget. But when you design to a budget, when you design to a price point, you will always make compromises. It's inevitable. But for us at Razor, we design the product first then we put a price to it because, and we are, we are upfront about the fact that we make a premium because our customer base wants the best, right? They don't want to compromise. And, and that's the customer that we want. We don't want to uh, compromise just to make bigger numbers or, you know, what's, uh, or, or to hit additional revenues, etc. Our focus is the best possible product. We put it at a price that we have a premium, we have profits, and we're open to our customers to say, these profits get churned back in terms of even better R&D. And that's, that's what allows us to win the, the seven consecutive best of CESs. We get the, the, the fans who are really, really passionate about our brand. They tattoo our logos and themselves because we just don't compromise on that aspect. Mm -hmm. And kind of, kind of pulling back towards the, the, the complex that is, that is Razor, when you're looking at building a company such as Razor, what, is, what are three or four things that you've always kept your eyes on? Like, these things, these are metrics, or these are kind of philosophies that I never compromise on. Of course, the, the, the building the best products, of course, and whatnot. But like, how do you build a better organization? How do you build a more robust HR structure? What do you do that makes Min Razor's Min? Well, first up, I don't think you know Razor is Min's uh, to speak of. Right? I mean, it's the team and it's the communities. I think first up, um, overall, I think the community is important to us. Uh, we don't see them as a customer base. In fact, they are part of the, the, what is our core values, which is Team Razor. And within Team Razor, we say it's not just the, the team within the company, but the wider audience. That's important to us. So the community, incredibly important. Everything that we do, it's for gamers, by gamers, and that's first up. Talent or the team again, but now the internal team is incredibly important too. So we've, in the past 10 years, we've got close to 1,000 people nine offices worldwide, we go, to where the, we go to where the talent is and we bring the talent um, within at Razor. And it's not easy working at Razor because the responsibilities are incredible. When we design a product, you know, um, it's cool to see the fans being very passionate. It's very cool to see the, pants, uh, the fans tattooing logos and themselves and things like that. But it's a huge, huge responsibility. There's no one that we will copy from, no one that we can copy from because we are, we're number one in the industry. There's nobody that we can technically hire from to learn from because we're always pushing the envelope right at the outset. So getting the best talent 
is, is super, super, I think, important. And I think the third thing for us is always maintaining a focus. We actually don't do uh, many products at Razer. We have very few SKUs, if you think about it. Like, we've got three laptops, right? For a company of, of, of um, the engineering group of our size, we've got three laptops, you know, uh, and we, we clearly define the SKUs that we have because our teams are really, really small. And our teams are hyper-passionate. We get a lot of things done, but it's more about what we don't do than the things that we do. So we tend to be very, a bit closed off sometimes um, um, on a general corporate level. We don't really do, um, re you know, we don't announce things like fundraising and, and, and stuff like that in general. We, we are really focused, all our PR, et cetera, is just focused on um, the products that we make, um, what we do for the community, and what we want to do with the community. Mm. So pretty much three things. Mm. And I mean, I, we're, we're, we're kind of uh, clocking down in terms of uh, four minutes, but can you give us, I mean, it doesn't have to be a speech, but there's a lot of founders here in the audience and also watching right now who are looking at how, like, again, I don't have to be where Min is right now, but what kind of wisdom or what kind of insight can you give would-be founders who are trying to build something bigger than themselves? What can you give in terms of advice that you wish you knew back then that could be of great help to, uh, to, to the, the next men or the next jobs um, that could be watching this right now. Can you give us uh, some, some words of advice? Um, so first up, I always find it quite amusing when people ask me for advice because you know, we're just doing what we're doing, I think generally day-to-day um, uh, -day focused on the product. But I think the, the one thing which is, uh, you know, I, I constantly remind myself um, today is just about focus. And I think that is the single most important thing. And focus goes in terms of the design of our product, right? For every product that um, Razer does, we tend to have a single line. Everything needs to be distilled right down to a single line, and everything else is superfluous on top of that. And it's just constantly taking it out, you know, over and over again. A business model, a single line. Everything else can be taken out on top of that. Of course, you know, over and above there are attenuating, I think, factors on top of that, but maintaining a sense of focus is incredibly important. And it will serve, I think, in almost all aspects. It's a little bit zen-like in that nature to really pare away everything that is um, non-essential, you know, everything that adds on to that. So even, for example, fundraising. You know, I think, I think when we went out fundraising, I must have spoken to hundreds or thousands of people, right? And um, it doesn't matter because at the end of the day, you just have an audience of one. The one guy that goes, okay, I get it. I'm crazy enough to put some money with you, and here you go, right? Whether it's fundraising or whether it's a business model, it's really telling yourself that that is your single-minded goal, and everything else does not matter. It doesn't matter if, um, with all due respect, my VC gets um, nervous or, or my investors get nervous, or it doesn't matter if um, things get tough. Because at the end of the day, when you're trying to to, to get something truly great done, it's incredibly difficult. But you need to understand that only you, at, at the end of the day, it's just yourself that you need to execute this on behalf of everyone else. Mm. That's it. And I think one really important thing that people might want to know but don't ask a lot is, how do you deal with stress? How do you deal with setbacks? Are there specific rituals you do? Or are there specific kind of mindsets or protocols that you have cultivated uh, throughout the years that help you get across it. And again, focus is great, but when there's setbacks, it defocuses you, right? Mm -hmm. How does we as v Razor zero back in when there are setbacks or there are barriers? Sure. So this is a, this is a fun question I get often. And um, I think the gamers in the, in the audience will probably appreciate this. I mean, when you play a game, when you hit a, when you hit a setback, when you hit a challenge, it's, you, you find all ways and means. It's a jumping challenge, damn it. You keep jumping and you do it over and over again to try to get past that stupid jumping challenge. You can't get past that. You start going on the internet looking for walkthroughs. Back in the day, you ask your pals, you get the Konami code or, or what have you. So the, the, the thing about, at least from only my own personal perspective, is whenever something bad happens, well, Somebody like, steals your laptop and CES. Yeah, you know, like, I, yeah. Like, <laughs> oh, well, there you go, there you go. Right. So, <laughs> so for like half a second, it's, it's a pain, right? Then I get this search of, holy shit, we're going to 
get past this because it's going to be good fun. And every single one of these become incredibly exciting. You know, for half a second, it's like, fuck. You know, it's like, this, this really sucks, right? But over and above after that, you go like, all right, I'm going to kick ass. I'm going to find a way to get past this. And we're just going to go out there and um, change the world. That's you, what we do. You know, I should have swore more people are laughing. So I guess this is fucking it. Uh, thank you very <laughs> much, man. All right, thank you very Great. much.